Mindsetters, welcome to your exam school lesson for grade 10. It is Physical Sciences and you're with Looney and Tracy. Hello <laughs> everyone, it's good to see you and Mindsetters, I hope that you've got your thinking caps on and Mindsetters, it's specifically that you're going to be doing a lot of revision with us because of course you're coming to the end of it, the end of your year, end of grade 10 and you really want to make sure that you shine in this last stretch. Cool. So Tracy, what are we doing for the Great Ten today? Sorry, mine said it's today, as I said, exam revision. And specifically, we're going to be talking about physics. And physics is fun. Physics is about movement and motion and waves and electri electricity and electrostatics. So we're going to be revising some concepts uh, for physics and for your paper one exam, your physics exam. All right, cool. Great Tens, I hope you guys are excited. As Tracy said, it's the last stretch of Great Ten, and we want you guys to pass those exams so that you make it to Grade 11 next year. Remember that you can hit us up on Facebook on facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Our Twitter handle is at learn extra and you can get all your exam school notes on learn.mindset.co.za forward slash extra forward slash revision forward slash exam school. That is the link for exam school revision notes. So I'll post everything on our Facebook page, but the notes are on our page right now. So you can click on those and get yourself the notes so that you can prep yourself for the lesson like Tracy will help you. And remember, the exam school lesson is proudly brought to you by the MTN SA Foundation. So thank you so much. And Tracy, take it away. Thanks so much, Lini. So mindset is, as we said, we're going to be doing some revision and we want to get into revising concepts that you've studied this year. So we're going to be revising concepts of motion, of waves, of energy, mechanical energy, and electrostatics. There are other things like electricity, but I thought, in terms of just the number of questions that you can handle on a, on a revision lesson like today, I want to make sure we cover some of those. We also need to discuss some strategies in terms of answering exam problems and solving pr physics problems. So often you get you, you sit in the exam venue, you open the page, the paper, and you'll see a question and you need to know what am I going to do in terms of answering these questions? What is the strategy that I need to approach an unknown problem? Because there will be questions that you will never have seen before and I don't want you to panic and I don't want you to stress out, but I do want you to be able to say, okay, read the information and gather what it is that we, need to, we are asked to do. So we need to talk through some strategy. Always, I pose to you a challenge question. And this challenge question is all about a boy running along and grabbing onto a rope and swinging. And so it's got movement and it's got energy. Let's go into it. A boy of unknown mass, and that's in interesting, of unknown mass, runs from rest with an acceleration of 1.7 meters per second squared and grabs onto a stationary rope. So the rope is just hanging there, hanging from a tree. It is nine meters away from his starting point. He, he grabs onto the rope and swings up to a height H above the ground. There are two parts to this challenge question. First, they're asking you to find the velocity with which he's moving when he grabs the rope. So as he's running along, he's going to grab onto that rope and swing up to there. What is his speed or velocity when he collides or grabs onto that rope? And then how high does he get? What is the height to which he swings? So how high does that rope swing up? So that's your challenge question, and I really want you to go and spend some time working it out, um, possibly during one of our breaks. So I've given you a quick summary here in terms of what is it that you would need to do when you get an unknown physics problem, something you've never seen before, and specifically how to handle it. So these are my tips and hints. Number one, I always like to sketch the scenario. So it's just a quick, rough sketch. Please don't spend forever on it. If you do, you're not going to finish your paper. Don't spend long on it, but just quickly sketch the scenario. So maybe it's a bus moving to the right, and you just a little block with wheels on it and an arrow to the right. Okay? That kind of thing can really help you to interpret the information because so <coughs> often you can then fill in information from the, the question onto that picture. And a picture says a thousand words. So sketch the scenario. Then list all the known information. And sometimes you might want to write it on your picture. Other times you could actually literally write a list. That could be helpful for you. And while, once you've done that, you can remind yourself 
to check for conversions. And remember that we're working with everything in SI units. So if something is given to you in kilometers per hour, it's useful to convert it to meters per second because then if you're asked to find an acceleration, you can work that out into meters per second squared. You can't do that if it's in kilometers per hour. So convert to SI units if it's not already in SI units. And then you need to choose an appropriate equation. So once you've understood the scenario, you've written your list, you've con checked for converting, and then you can say, okay, what is still, what is the question asking me? I can choose from what information I have, I can choose the question, the equation that's gonna best suit that. Then you get marks for substituting. So please write the original equation, just as it is from possibly your data sheet, write up that original equation. And then go and substitute in all the values you know. Please show the substitution. Once you've shown the substitution, you should get marks for those. Okay, so show the substitution and you will be well on your way to getting good marks. Then solve the, problem, the um, equation and write your answer with units and direction. So check that you always give units because some value very often means nothing. It can mean nothing if you've given me its velocity is five. Five what? Five meters per second, okay? Or the, the frequency is nine million. Nine million what? Nine million hertz. Those types of things, the units are incredibly important. And then if it is a vector quantity, remember we discussed vectors and scalars, vectors have to have direction. So give units and direction, particularly if it's a vector quantity, and then always go back and check that you've actually answered the question. So go back to the start and go and see if there's anything that you're missing and that you've actually answered the question, because it might ask you how far has the ball dropped, but actually you've worked out the, the, the whole height of the building and you can, you can go from there in terms of answering what they actually are asking you. So those are my tips and hints. Let's get cracking into some answering some questions. So exam question number one. A ship sends out a sound wave as it collects data for mapping the ocean floor. What type of wave is a sound wave? So we've got a sound wave. What type of wave is that? Well, this is information. It is a longitudinal wave because a sound wave is, by definition, a longitudinal wave. Sketch the type of this type of wave, labeling all identifying characteristics. Now, this is very interesting because what you've got is you've got areas of compression and then areas of spacing out and then areas of compression and then areas of spacing out. So this is my quick sketch of a longitudinal wave. Let's write that in. And with this wave, I need to write in areas where the compression is. Those are called compressions. So here's another one on this side. And then these areas where they're spreading out it are called rarefactions. So you've got an area where the sound wave, as it passes through, it compresses the air particles, or in this case, the water particles. They compress together. And then the areas where there's a spreading out or stretching out called a rarefaction. Now, the next one. If the speed of sound in seawater is taken as this. So notice I'm going to circle or highlight or in some way indicate that value. Calculate how far below the surface is the, the un, an underwater mountain range if it takes 2,3 seconds for the pulse to be detected once again by a stationary ship. Ignore other factors which may influence the speed of sound in water, such as temperature, pressure, or the salinity of the water. Now that's helpful. So what we've got in this scenario, I'm gonna sketch the picture. Remember, these are my tips and hints. 
So let's draw a quick, that's my little ship. And in the water, it is sending out a pulse. And that pulse goes down, hits the surface, and bounces up again, okay? Underneath the water, there is this underwater mountain range. I don't know, I don't wanna pick, draw it as severely as that. Okay, that's the ocean floor. And this question right at the start spoke about the ship sending out a sound wave to collect data for mapping the ocean floor. And that's what the, these massive ships do in terms of scientific research. They want to dis determine where the crevices are and where the mountain ranges are, that kind of thing. So, very interesting. They might find here there's a mountain range. And so the ship is going along and detecting this mountain range. So, what information do I know? I've sketched the scenario quickly. I am told two values. The values are that the speed of s sound in water is 1,560 meters per second. And there will be other things. If, the, if you've got extreme pressures, if you've got um, salinity, the, the salt level in the water can also affect it. But we are ignore, told to ignore pressure and temperature and salinity. So we are taking that as the, at face value, that is the speed of sound in water. The other value that we know is the time. But I want you to think about this. I've drawn this very specifically. The time that they give us is 2.3 seconds for the pulse to go down, hit the mountain range, and come back, almost like an echo. So as the sound wave is going out, it's coming back. How far has it traveled? Well, it's actually gone there and back. It has traveled twice the distance. So notice... I'm writing here to go there and back. So in terms of my question, I need to go and say, do I need to convert or do anything to these values? Yes, I do. I need to say, well, hold on. So therefore, the time to go just one distance is going to be 2.3 seconds divided by 2. And so I'm going to go along to my calculator and say 2.3 divided by 2, get my answer and write it down as 1, 1, 5 seconds. That is to go one distance, just to the mountain range. That's going to be very helpful because now I can go and choose an appropriate equation. And the equation I would need to use is going to be velocity is equal to change in position over change in time. The velocity is constant, so I can use this equation. I'm specifically asking to find the distance or the change in position, also known as the displacement. So I want that by itself is equal to velocity multiplied by time. The velocity was 1560, and the time, we said, was going to be 1.156, uh, 1, 1 1.15 seconds. Going across to my calculator, I already have that value in there, so multiply 1560 is equal to 1,794 meters. So we can write our answer in 1,794 meters below the surface. But have I answered the question? Check. I want to go back. Have I done it? Calculate how far below the surface. Yes, I've done that. All that other information. But watch out. They're asking us something specific. 
give your answer in kilometers. So now we've got to go back to our answer and convert this value to kilometers. How do we do that? Well, for kilometers, we must divide by a thousand. So come along here, one, two, three little jumps of my decimal place. It's going to be 1.794 kilometers below the surface. That's pretty deep. Okay? And that is my final answer. Notice how sketching us in the scenario, working through the steps, listing the information, choosing appropriate equation, you can actually get to the final answer, but always go back and check that you've actually answered the question. I think that's enough for now. Looney, over to you. We'll take a short break, and I want you to try that challenge question. All right. Mindset is if you have a brother, a sister, a cousin, a friend, a best friend, you know, a niece, a nephew, who has a learner's or a driver's license, please make sure that they are watching or you tell them about the Be A Bright Spark competition. We're going to take a break, but I'll tell you more about the competition straight after this. Welcome back, Mindsetters. So before the break, I told you about the Be A Bright Spark competition, and I said I'd give you more details about the competition. So we're giving away one of four Chevy Sparks this year in three weeks' time. November 23rd, we're announcing the winner. And how you can enter, remember I told you to tell all your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, your aunts and your uncles, they have a learner's or a driver's license to enter the Be A Bright Spark competition. How you do that, you can either buy the official... Ooh, Sorry, guys. <laughs> you can either buy the official Safeways K53 Learners and Drivers Manual. It's available throughout your South African retailers. Or, oh, okay, if you bought the book, you must keep the receipt. Or you can download the app from your Google Play Store for all your Samsung smartphone users, all right? Once you've done that, you visit our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash learn extra. There's a competition tab there. You click on it, you put in all your details, and then you enter the competition. Then you share the competition with all your friends to get an extra entry into the competition. And then you go to the official Safeways K53 page. You like that page and you like our Facebook page as well. And you're done entering. And remember, guys, until Thursday, from this time until Thursday, we have a competition going on where we're giving away a Google Play voucher with 150 Rand for all you guys to win so that you can download the app on your Google Play Store to stand a chance to enter the competition and win that Chevy Spark. So make sure you visit the official Safeways K53 page. There's a little doggy there driving a car, and we're asking you to caption that picture by commenting under that picture. So you caption it. Make it very cool, guys, because we're going to pick the coolest caption of them all. Then you'll stand a chance to win the 150 Rand Google Play voucher to download the K53 app to be a bright spark. Remember, three weeks from now, we're giving away the first of four cars, so make sure you are tuned in. It will be a live show, and we'll give you all the details about that, but make sure be a bright spark. Enter. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Looney. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Mine says it's so valuable to have your driver's license, and so do make sure that you do that in due time. But for now, you're focusing and you're studying for your grade 10 physics exam. And I've got another exam question here for you. The captain of the ship, so we're still on, that, on board that ship, radios back to shore using a frequency of 1.27 megahertz. Notice that capital M is standing for mega, and it's now megahertz. State two properties of a radio wave. So we need to think through, what do we know about radio waves? Well, firstly, you need to identify that a radio wave is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, and remember that electromagnetic spectrum is a continuous spectrum from gamma rays, microwaves, all those kind of infrared, visible light, ultraviolet. There's a whole spectrum of of electromagnetic radiation, and radio waves are one of them. And so in terms of listing properties, you actually need to think, well, what are then the properties of all electromagnetic radiation? What can I tell? Electromagnetic radiation, so we know, does not need 
a medium. to pass through. It can travel through a vacuum. And so that's something interesting. It does not need a medium to pass through. The second point I'd like to make is that in a vacuum, it travels at a speed of 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second in a vacuum. Okay. It is traveling at a constant speed of the speed of light or the speed of electromagnetic radiation. Always travels um, in a vacuum at that constant speed, the speed of light. So those are two points of properties of all electromagnetic radiation and would be true of radio waves as well. Determine the period of the radio wave. Now, when we speak about period, we're talking about the time taken for one complete cycle. Remember, that's the definition of the period. The period is the time taken for one complete cycle. And so the period is, by definition, 1 over the frequency. I was given the frequency. This whole value was the frequency. So it's going to be 1 over 1.27 megahertz. But hold on, what is a megahertz? What is, what is megahertz? Mega stands for times 10 to the power of 6. Mega is a big value. Think about megabytes. So you've got kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes. The idea is a mega, mega is the prefix is named for 10 to the power of 6. Okay, so now I can go along and punch that up and punch that in my calculator. Get this in. 1 divided by 1.27 times 10 to the power of 6. And that is the answer. No, we'll notice 1 divided by, if I have my decimal point, and I want you to look closely on the calculator here, if I'm jumping on my decimal, it's going to jump six places. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that would get you back to 1.27. <coughs> so notice we've got our answer there. But I want to write it as a decimal, and I'm going to include that. So it is 7.87. Seven point eight seven times ten to the power of, and I think it was minus seven. Let's check it. Minus seven, and I need you to notice here that that is in seconds. Okay. Having a look, it would actually be, if you were to write this out, jumping that decimal place along, naught point, and I'm going to just write a whole bunch of noughts, and we'll count them in a minute. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's going to be right. It is that much of a second. <laughs> so a fraction of a second, a very, very, very small time for one wave to be completed. So a very, very, very small number. And that is why it's useful to be able to write that small number in scientific notation, because it's so quick and easy to maybe leave out a zero. But it's far better to write in scientific notation. You'll get far less chance of writing it down incorrectly. Then they ask us to calculate the wavelength of the radio wave. So we've now talked about the period and some properties. And now I want us to talk about the wavelength. And to do that, I want to write the wave equation. So what I'm going to ask us to do actually firstly is list these values. What do we know? We've got the frequency of 1.27 times 10 to the power of 6 hertz. What other values do we have? Well, I want you to consider that we've actually got C, which is the speed of light or the speed of this wave in a vacuum. And it's not much less in 
um, and air, so we're going to just work with that as the speed of the radio wave. And so actually we do have enough information to work with it. Now, you could, I agree, go and work with the period as well. But because I was given that value as a frequency, uh, maybe I made a mistake with the period, and, but I have that as a given value, so let's work with that instead. We've got C is equal to frequency multiplied by lambda. Notice I write my original equation first, then I can substitute in, so 3 times 10 to the power of 8, as my one value, the frequency 1.27 times 10 to the power of 6 times lambda. So I'm taking this to the other side and it's going to give me 3 times 10 to the power of 8 divided by 1.27 times 10 to the power of 6 is going to give me lambda. So lambda it looks a little bit like an x, there you are. Lambda is going to be equal to, go back to our calculator, clearing that 3 times 10 to the power of 8 divided by 1.27 times 10 to the power of 6. And we get our answer as 236.22. 236.22. And checking it, and the units there are in meters. And that's a really long wavelength, but if you think about it, the high frequency, l um, sorry, low frequency, high wavelength, I think. Is that right? We've got it going across. Perfect. Okay, so we can work with that value. Have we answered the question? calculate the wavelength? Yes, we have. Let's move on to question three now. And question three is quite a different question. So we spent a bit of time talking about waves, talking about motion. We now need to go and talk a little bit about electrostatics. So we've got two identical metal spheres. It's important that they're metal because the metal would be a conductor. A and B on an insulated surface. So the metal sphere is holding that charge on an insulated surface and the charge can spread out over the whole surface of the metal but not on the actual, um, won't be on the surface at all. They carry charges of negative 2.8 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs and 4.5 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs respectively. So they each have their individual charges a and B as shown in the diagram. Now I want you to recognize here that the examiner has already given you the sketch. So they've given you point one. Then they've also written up some information. Always read the, inf the information at the start because there might be something extra there. And here we have the spheres are brought to in contact with each other as shown in the diagram below. So they've helped you by giving you the picture. Very interesting, the one is negative, the one is positive. So what can you tell me immediately? Well, they're going to attract one another because they've got opposite charges. Then what's going to happen? Well, it is observed that the spheres move apart after contact. So they first come together, as you can see in the picture, and then they move apart after contact. Briefly explain this observation. Well, I want you to consider here that when they are brought together, this one has excess electrons. Okay? This one has a shortage of electrons. Okay? So what's going to happen is that the charge will spread evenly over both of them while they're in contact because it's now if they're in contact it is as if they were one object and so those excess electrons can spread out over where there is a shortage as well and the new charge will be dispersed over that whole now one object A and B together okay once that has happened 
they are going to move apart because they're now going to have the same charge. And so they will repel one another. So let's write down something here. Okay. A has excess electrons while B has a shortage of electrons. When in contact, so touching, the electrons are spread evenly Sorry, let's just give ourselves some more space. Over the whole object. And I'm putting here A and B combined. Okay. That is because this is a metal as it is, or they are. Um, sorry, let's just... Oops, sorry. Oopsie. Let's go back here. As they are metals. Metal spheres. The next point I want us to make is that thus the electrons or Maybe we can write each sphere now has the same charge. And that is your critical point. At the end, they're going to have the same charge and so therefore will repel one another. So it's like they come together, they share the charge evenly around the whole thing, because it's now one object, and suddenly they've got the same charge. So they want to repel and get as far away from each other as they can. Calculate the new charge on each sphere after they have moved apart. So we had objects coming together, now objects moving apart. Let's sketch that. When they are together, it's the total charge. When they move apart, that charge is now spread evenly. So let's write down the charges. We first need to add them together, and it's going to be negative 2.8 times 10 to the power of negative 9, I think it was, nanocoulombs, plus 4.5 times 10 to the power of negative 9. So add it together, go to our calculator, 2.8, sorry we had, I think it was negative, so negative 2.8 times 10 to the power of negative 9 plus 4.5 times 10 to the power of negative 9 and that's going to give me uh, total value and it is 1.7 1.7 times 10 to the power of negative 9 coulombs in total now we come along here and that charge is going to be spread between both so therefore when apart it's going to be 1.7 times 10 to the power of negative 9 divided by 2 because they're two objects. So back here, take that answer, divide it by 2, and we get there 8.5 times 10 to the power of negative 10. 8.5 times 10 to the power of negative 10 coulombs each. And that has I believe answered that question. 
We've got one more question to go, and I think we're going to stop here and take a short break. And when we come back, we'll finish this last question and do the challenge question. So I hope you're working on that one during this break. Thanks, Lenny. All right. Mindsetters, we also want you guys to share your views about what you think of buying your license. So the question was posted on our Facebook page. Go and check it out and answer it, and then we'll check some, out, check some of your comments out and then see what you guys have to say. I'll ask Tracy after the break what she thinks of buying your license. We'll see you straight after this break. Welcome back from the break, guys. I hope you're still enjoying your exam school lesson for physical sciences with Tracy and Looney. So before the break, Tracy, I was asking what your thoughts would be of like buying your license. So instead of going for your lesson and getting tested, taking driving lessons and all of that on the day, getting tested, doing your parallel parking and all that stuff, actually buying your license, what do you think of that? I think that's very <laughs> scary. <laughs> and uh, I think I'm actually a little bit horrified at the concept because the reality is is the reason you go through those lessons is so that you can learn something and so that when you get onto the road in a real scenario and you're actually driving a car that you know how to handle a handle the car and b that you know and understand the rules of the road so that we're all much safer. So please don't go and buy your license. <laughs> Firstly, it's illegal. Secondly, secondly, I hear it's very expensive compared uh, and to I, the I imagine it must yes. be. But more, more importantly, in terms of just ethical values, to think about why do we have to have rules of the road and why do we have to have you know, a person learning them is so that we are all safe on the roads. And so in terms of just the way we can lead South Africa and, and make a difference is certainly to make sure that we all obeying the rules of the road. And you're not going to know what they are unless you actually go and learn them. So go in and take that, that stand with your friends as well and, um, and challenge them if they want to go and buy a license or bribe someone, <laughs> certainly not. Mm. You need to make sure that you understand the rules of the road and that you, you take that test so that you can stand legally um, before a court of law if you ever had to, hopefully not, but, but certainly that you can take a stand with your yes, friends. Yes, and well. also that feeling of actually getting your license and being proud of what you've achieved. It's so great, guys. Like, so don't please don't buy your licenses. Do it the legal way. And don't forget to enter the Be A Buy Spark competition. Tell all your friends about it. Don't forget to share your views about buying your licenses on our Facebook page because Tracy just gave us a 10 out of 10 answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> on with the lesson, Tracy. Thanks, Looney. So mindset is it's very important that, that you do make sure that you learn things because it's all for your benefit. As we come along here to this question, we calculate the number of electrons tra transferred from one sphere to the other during contact. The issue here is that the one object has lost electrons, and the other one has gained electrons. So I'm drawing them separately just so that I can picture and, and illustrate. You could choose either of these. Now I'm going to choose to work with this object, which I think was A. It was a negative one, okay? Because what I want to identify is that was the charge it originally had, and at the end of the day, it now has a charge when they move apart, has a charge of, and I had it there, positive 8.5 times 10 to the negative 10 coulombs. So first and foremost, I want to work out the difference. What has happened to go from there to there, this guy has lost electrons, okay? So it would be helpful to work out that difference. And I'm going to grab a calculator here. I've got that value, and I want to work out, I'm going to take the negative 2.8 times 10 to the power of 9, sorry, negative 9, negative 2.8 times 10 to the power of negative 9. And from that, I'm going to subtract this value, 8.5 times 10 to the power of negative 10. Hopefully, we're going to get a difference here. So negative 3.65 times 10 to the power of negative 9, as I think what it was. Okay. From there, that is the difference in charge. It 
And from that difference in charge, you need to say, well, how many electrons is that? Well, hold on. If you know what one electron is, then and the charge on one electron, then you should know, well, how many electrons it is. And the charge on one electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So if you've taken that difference, negative 3.65 times 10 to the negative 9, and divided by the charge on each electron, that should give you how many electrons there were. So I'm taking that and I'm saying, divide it by negative 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19. And that's going to give me how many electrons? 2.2. And I missed the rest of them. 2.28. Remember, we're rounding off to two decimal places. Times 10 to the power of 10 electrons were transferred. And that should get you that question. Now, the challenge question. We've got two parts to this challenge question, and I hope that you've gone and tried them for yourselves. Remember, we're going to start with sketching the scenario. So we had a boy of unknown mass, runs from rest with an acceleration of that and grabs onto a stationary rope hanging nine meters away. So I'm going to just quickly sketch. Here's a tree. Here's the rope. And he is running a distance of nine meters. From where he starts, okay, across to that rope. Now, I want to know a few things. His acceleration was 1.7 meters per second squared. What else do we know? Not much. He starts from rest, and that's another interesting point. So we've got three pieces of information. And as I come along here, notice I'm writing a list. I've got the acceleration, I've got the displacement as 9 meters, and I have the initial velocity of 0 meters per second, because he started from rest. And so I can work on solving this. Now I'm asked to find his final velocity. Notice how a list can really help you. Do I have anything about the time here? No, I don't. So I have to work with an equation that is going to not include time. And there it is. V final is what I'm after. So V final squared is equal to V initial, that is naught squared, which is going to be naught as well, plus 2A, 1.7, delta x is 9. Notice how I've written the original equation and I'm now substituting in. So I go across to my calculator and I've written writing 2 multiplied by the 1.7 multiplied by 9 and that's giving me 30.6. But is that my final answer? No, it's not because notice that is squared. So I have to square root for v final, it's going to be the square root of 30.6, which is going to give me, oh sorry, oopsie, wrong one, apologies, square root 30.6 is equal to, and that's my answer, he's going at 5.53 meters per second. 5.53 meters per second, and 
it is with a direction because this is a vector quantity forward. Okay, next question. So we've done part A. The next question, the height to which he swings. So if you can imagine, this is my little rope. He is going to swing upwards like that. Okay. The issue here is that it is a pendulum motion. So you can't use any of the values or any of the, I should say, equations of motion because that is a circular path. And remember, the equations of motion are only specifically for linear motion. So we have to use a different set of equations, and that is your mechanical energy. So I can say here, mechanical energy must be conserved. And I've written EM1 is equal to EM2. And EM1 is going to be at the bottom, and this one is going to be at the top. The mechanical energy must be conserved in the top. So, what do I have with mechanical energy? Mechanical energy is the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. And that is at 1. The next one, potential energy at 2 plus kinetic energy at 2. And as you imagine this rope swinging up to a point, we need to notice at this highest point here, it is going to have a max EP. But for a moment, he is going to be stationary. And so that is very helpful. Whereas at the bottom of the swing, his EK is going to be a maximum, but his EP is going to be zero. Why? Because it's at the bottom, it's not above the ground. So I can go and substitute in a number of things. EP here is at the bottom is zero, plus half mv squared, equal to EP at the top, that's going to be mass times gravity times height, plus zero. Now can you see this is actually becoming a lot simpler, because I have got only two terms. Those two fall away, and so we have half mv squared is equal to mass times gravity times height. Should we try and substitute? I think that would be a good idea. And we've got half, well, what is m? I don't know. The velocity was 5.53 and that is squared, and it's multiplied by m, is equal to m times gravity, which is 9.8, times the height. Now you're going to say to me, well, Tracy, what do I do? I don't know what this m is. They said to us in the question, it's unknown. And that's important. But look at it. Do we need to know it? Think about this. We've got mass in each term on either side of the equi equal sign, so we can just cancel them. Divide by m all the way through. And so this equation becomes a lot simpler. So I'm gonna go and I'm going to square that value. So 5.53 squared is equal to, times that by half, and I'm going to get here, sorry, let's, Go, it was, I think, 15.29 is equal to 9.8 times height. And I can say 15.29 divided by 9.8, and that should give me the height. So 15.29 divided by 9.8 and is giving me 1.56. And that is in meters. That is how high he gets up off the ground, which is pretty high if you think about it with the swing. Mindset is, 
I want to urge you, before your physics exam, to spend lots of time going through questions and past papers. That is really how you will challenge yourself and in your thinking. So from me, Tracy, keep well, God bless, study hard, and do your, really, really your very best in these exams. Thank you so much, Tracy, for the lesson. Mindset is at home. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you to the MTN SA Foundation for bringing us this lovely show. Until next time, guys, goodbye from us.